Now I'm going to make a bold assumption that everybody in this room has either been in a hospital or has had a family member who's been hospitalized. Now with that, around the bedside now, if you imagine yourself in the hospital bed, you're seeing the, the, the wonders of modern technology. Monitors, um, different types of equipment around, that each one were innovations in themselves, there to save lives. So you have the experience, you have this wonderful technology, and you have sick patients, the sickest patients ever, we've ever kept alive, now being healthy. And on patients are now being handled rather than ICUs. So you have this great scenario. Now I'm going to put forth to you, there's two things in that same scenario. The first experience is you'll hear this. Beep, beep, beep. It will go on for longer. That's the sound of an alarm. Followed by this sound. The response of a healthcare provider to that alarm. <laughs> We've all experienced it. Multitude of alarms. 98% of the alarms are false alarms. If all this technology, all this goodness, and it's there to protect from unwitted harm, but what happens is there's so many alarms that go off. Sometimes in a patient's bed, one every minute or two minutes or three minutes. But what happens is that people get very, very attuned to those. And so people are very fearful of the thing called the crying wolf syndrome, which is you have the alarms go off, but the alarms are going off so many times, and they're not really causing a harm. They're just false alarms. The odds are 98% of the time, I don't have to answer it. Everything will be OK. But if you're the patient or the family sitting there, and you're thinking, how do I know doesn't know this alarm is real? It's about me. The alarms are going off. They told me all this technology is there to save my life, and the alarms are going off. And granted, I may even have a, a call bell, a call bell, I say with a call bell, and I'll ask for help. So I press the call bell. Excuse me, I can't hear you. The person will be right with you. But the alarms are going off. They're busy. They'll be with you shortly. And there's been descriptions of that shortly can last anywhere from a minute to hours. So the question is, we have all this technology to be good, but now we've taken all the technology together, and we have this situation where actually it could lull people into a false sense. Now, for, for me, it's been a 30-year journey. I'm, by background, an ICU doctor. So monitors are my business. And I remember after 30 years of many times going home from the ICU, and I'd be falling asleep, and in my sleep, as I'm about to fall, all I would hear are alarms going off. It was uncanny. I would, I would know that I would be able to fall asleep when the alarms were stopping. Um, but I would keep hearing it. So I just imagine how a family felt or a patient felt with this. So like everything else, you wanted to find out, well, geez, how, do we how do we take care of this? Because there's two elements, the number of alarms that are going off, and then the response to an alarm. Now, for the number of alarms that are going off, that's a lot of technology out there. To get new, new systems in place it takes a lot of FDA approval. It takes years for new monitoring systems to go in place. So that, that really is not going to be a, a quick solution. So like everything else, I went to the literature. So let's go to the literature. What does the literature say about this? And lo and behold, uh, they call it the crying wolf syndrome. So it has a name, um, uh, not as famous as Tommy John surgery. Um, if you're in baseball, but you have a name, crying wolf syndrome. And there's over a thousand articles probably out there, and all describe the same phenomena. So they keep describing the same phenomena. These are alarms are a problem. They keep going off. And in fact, in our hospital, this is how many alarms went off. But in our setting, this is how many alarms went off. So Einstein would be looking right now and would be singing that little quote that he has, a definition of insanity is redoing the same thing over and over again and taking a different solution. Well, everybody keeps publishing the same stuff. And some of the smartest physicians and scientists in the world is still patient experience is still there, and no one has actually come up with, how do we fix this? 
So the, the literature in healthcare doesn't really help. So it made us start thinking, let's look, let's break, let's break the glass a little bit. Industries handle this. What are the other high technology industries that are really actually highly reliable? So if you look at NASA, highly technology, hot, lots of equipment, lots of technology, air travel, right? We talk about how uh, reliable they actually are for the load that they're doing. Uh, aircraft carriers, the bridge, of, the bridge of a ship, you know, when they have all the technology all together, all those, they're, they're known in the literature being very, very highly reliable, which means they can't afford to have an error. High technology, lots of software, lots of alarms that go off all the time, but they cannot afford to have an injury. And in fact, what they found in their experiences is whenever they've had a major catastrophic event, it's been people ignoring the alarms or assuming the early alarms weren't real, so they ignored it. So they came up with their own solutions of how to um, uh, take care of this. Now this is a picture, a, a, a classic picture of like an air traffic control area, or if you imagine yourself looking on an aircraft carrier or a nuclear sub, in old movies you see everybody on the bridge on, and looking at all the technology. And the people in there have all these screens and, they're, and all they're doing is monitoring. Their job is to monitor what's going on, not relying on what's going on uh, in, the, uh, in the boiler room or somewhere else in the uranium reactor or whatever. They'll isolate the stuff and then to tell people if there's a problem or not. So in there, we took a, le it took a little bit of a lesson and said, okay, so look at these highly reliably, high technology industries. Um, they also are striving to have they don't want any more than three errors per million, either flight or uh, days at sea or something. That's their standard, three million of something. 99.999% correct. Let's flip back to healthcare. Years gone by, I was, was living off of, well, if you have a one or 3% uh, error rate, that's okay. You know, if you're one of the 97% who doesn't have a complication or, 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 or an error. But if you're one of the 3%, you don't want to be there. Um, in healthcare, prescription writing has a 20% error rate to it. So these are what life used to be. And now we're going to where life should be. And in healthcare, where the rate of untoward events should be less than 1%. In fact, it should be Six Sigma or 99.99% accurate and reliable and error free. So we decided in the Moors to actually take some of the innovation in the, um, uh, uh, those reliable networks and find out what's in common. Some in common was exactly this. They had a way of actually taking all the, all the equipment, either through wires or other technology or wireless, and have them all come to central locations, have people who are monitoring this be, 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 be very dedicated. This is their job. At the bedside, you have people doing five, six, seven, eight, 10, 12 tasks. In order to set up a monitor, it's 35 tasks. Oh, and by the way, there's a patient you want to relate to and talk and teach with, but you have all this other stuff you have to do. So you're already multitasking at the bedside um, and you have all the technology. So they centralized uh, all the technology and just monitoring the patients. That's what their job is. They also have in common um, a way of communicating to that bedside. You know, they don't have a red phone. Uh, they pick up and they, and they dial in and say, you know, there may be a problem. They have an instant communication with the areas they need to go work with. Well, if you look at the modern world, do we have instantaneous technology? We have texting. Everybody in the world nearly has a cell phone. Everybody has the ability to text and communicate. So why can't we use something along those lines? But you just can't do what I described initially and just have a communication. You really need a visualization of the patient. Because somebody's got to say, is that patient OK or is this real or not? And you, can't, uh, and you have to do this in a way that is uh, systematized. So we took a lot of that and said, you know, let's brainstorm. So we had the luxury of building a brand new hospital four years ago, ground up, first new pediatric hospital ground up ever, and decided, let's bring it in. Let's build something 
there that has not been built before in order to protect the patients on the floors. Because this is where the danger is for people. Everybody has stories where in every hospital where patients were found uh, uh, with a major problem and the alarms have been going off and nobody answered or the alarms were going off and people ignored them. Not because they're bad people, just because they're busy doing a lot of other things. So we took the opportunity of the new hospital um, and built something and explained to 700 new people coming in to this hospital, well, this is the way we're going to do it. You're coming into a new hospital anyway, a new system. Let's get you attuned to this. Because, it, yes, it has never been done before, but trust us, this will work. So um, we went through it, and this is what it actually looks like. I played a little trick on the slides because it's the exact same slide I just showed you. Because the slide I showed you was a perception of what can happen in a control room. And this is the same slide that, that actually shows what our logistics center is, we call it. So these people are hired, um, trained people, to look at the monitors to communicate back. In addition, what we put in place was a small little camera in the room. Not a lot of equipment, not a lot of extra technology, it has to be programmed or whatever. You've seen them all. You walk through the airport, you look up in the sky or at a store, you see a little blue ball sitting down there, um, or in a casino if you're a gambler and you're looking, there's a little ball up there um, when you're looking. There's a little camera in there, so you're watched and videoed or whatever. So every one of the rooms have one of those. Now, they're not all on all the time. You have to respect privacy. But what happens is we decided to say, you know what, here's the best of the both worlds. We have people who can monitor. We have a way of... Uh, audioing, and actually there's a camera in there and a um, video system, so you can audio uh, and video into the room itself, and a way of looking at the uh, monitors. Now instead of just saying, all right, so every time an alarm goes off, because there's lots of them, this group will dial in um, in the room and say, your alarm's going off, because they're going to say, yes, thank you very much, I know the alarm's going off, I'm here, or whatever, that doesn't help. So we actually use a little bit, again, of the lessons learned, which is you have some time. You allow people to have a chance to answer the alarm, but give it some time. And we decided to give it about a minute and a half or two minutes. So after a minute and a half or two minutes, if someone, one or two people haven't answered, the team that's monitoring actually can go into the room and say, excuse me, I'm audioing in, I'm just checking on your, uh, your loved one or the nurse uh, to make sure everything's okay. It's all explained to the family ahead of time or the visitors what we're doing. And at least if nothing else, after a minute and a half, they're viewed and talked to to make sure everything is okay. And then there's a communication instantaneously to the provider saying, everything's okay or you need to get in there quickly. So we give the, the minute and a half, but we're assimilating what all the information is like. So we do that. And that monitoring was done in the new hospital, right there at the hospital. Opportunity two, all right, so is this transferable? Could this be something anybody else could do? So the opportunity here in the Moors is we now built a second hospital, or a second addi major addition to a hospital, which is approximately 700 miles away from the first hospital. Let's try it again. Let's now assimilate and see whether we can do this thing. Is it transferable? But we don't want to have it as um, take this one group and now mimic and rehire a second group and do this. This should work. This should be transferable. Let's do it from 700 miles away. If you can have a command center uh, in one place, monitoring from afar, you should be able to do it anywhere. And hence we did. So we mimicked it, and we went from monitoring 50 beds to monitoring now 200 beds overnight. Literally overnight we did it. And have it so that patients are monitored the exact same way uh, in order to build up that, that environment. Um, so now all of a sudden we've proven that it actually is reliable and it does uh, can monitor the patients, and patients are accepting of it. And very few patients at all, once it's explained, even no, nobody really complains. Once you understand what it is, they realize, wow, you're actually keeping me safer here because you're answering the alarm. You're alleviating their fear. Now, the question always is asked, when you think about this, so is it working? How do you know, you know in healthcare? Show me the numbers. Do the math. Are you making a difference or not? So here are the numbers we tabulated. Four years later, 24,000 patients, uh, 88,000 days, 3 million hours of care, 
we've had zero patients unexpectedly found on the floor in what they call a code blue state. The definition of six sigma is three per million. We're at zero per three million. So we feel it's been successful. It's a start, but it's taking the innovation that's been out there and realizing you can have other problems with other innovations, but taking innovation and applying it to a particular problem to actually make it safer for patients. Thank you.